Hello, everyone. Welcome to masteranatomy.info. I'm your favorite lecturer, Dr. Akang. And today we'll be looking at neurodevelopment. We're looking at neurodevelopment and we'll be emphasizing on the development of the spinal cord. But before then, we will look at the formation of the neural tube. We'll also look at the brain vesicles and their ventricles and flexures. Then we'll go into the spinal cord and meninges. Then we'll look at the clinical correlates. So let's go. Now, after the formation of the three germ layer, so we have the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. All right. The, um, the, there is first sign of um, the development of the neural plates from the ectoderm. All right. From the ectoderm. And this is induced by the notochord. By the notochord. Now, so the ectodermal layer the, begins to thicken up. The ectodermal layer overlying the notochord begins to thicken. And, and this occurs about the 16th day of intrauterine life. And so this is what I'm talking about, okay? This is the ectodermal layer, all right? And so it begins to thicken at this point. Begin, and this is the notochord, okay? So it induces thickening of this ectodermal layer such that the cells here proliferate and become thick, okay? And as it does so, because the center, which is directly overlying the... Um, the um, notochord, it thickens further, and there are so many cells, so it deepens, it deepens, forming a group. And later on, the, it forms a fold, and the two lateral ends would meet and form a tube. Let's look at the diagram in a more detailed form. So this is this is what I'm talking about. So this is the same thing. So that's the notochord, and this is how it forms a group. Okay, then it forms a, a, a tube, all right? And that's still the same ectodermal layer uh, and um so this i said begins to occur from the 16 the 18 of intrauterine life and it continues so the tube begins to form from the 21 and the 22 of intrauterine life okay and so uh now the tube after it begins to form it begins it closes in a zip like manner all right in a zip like manner so that's um, the upper part closes faster than the lower part. The upper part closes faster than the lower part, uh, so that the upper part will close about D25, while the lower part will close about D28, 27, 28, right? And D25, um, um, this occurs around the second to fourth absomites, while the, um, the uh, spinal cord, which is um, D28, will occur below the... Um, the somite for the fourth somite, all right? Everything below the fourth somite, all right? That forms the spinal cord, which is the um, caudal neuropore, all right? So the, the upper part, which is the cranial neuropore, now these openings, once the tube has been formed, imagine a tube, all right? It will have two openings, right? So if the tube is laid vertical, it will have two openings, one cranially and one um, caudally, right? Now, the cranial opening is called the Cranial opening is called the cranial neuropore, while the, the caudal opening is called the caudal neuropore. So because of head and tail foldings, all right, the spinal cord may, the, sorry, not the spinal cord, the neural tube may change its position rather than right, lying vertical, may lie anterior posteriorly. So at the end of the, the caudal neuropore becomes posterior neuropore, while the anterior neuropore becomes what they call, sorry, the, the cranial neuropore becomes what they call anterior neuropore. Is the same neuropore, just understand the same neuropore, and they have the same closure dates, all right, 25, and why the lower end will close later. It surprises me a lot of times why the lo lower end closes later, but I've come to discover that even though it is small and the upper end is big that forms the head, the upper end forms the head, uh, it closes earlier because it's short. While the lower end, it takes a long time. Remember, if it's zip like fold, it takes a longer time for it to completely close at the lower end. And so that's why it closes like two, three days after the, quarter, the cranial end has closed, okay? So now, um, the, if this neuropore fails to close, it results in what they call neural tube defects. And we'll look at some of them. Some of the neural tube defects we have, well, when the anterior neuropore fails to close, we have an encephaly, all right? There, there will be formation, no, no formation of the brain, all right? So you see that the absence of the brain and even the brain cap, 
or the score cap, what they call the Calvaria, will not be found. Okay. So um, uh, now you also realize that there's uh, intratentorial uh, re remnants, intratentorial remnants may be seen. Then you also have an um, adenohypophysis. So, so you could find that um, the anterior, anterior pituitary gland, right, could be found, the eyes, brain stem, those things may be spared. But the brain proper, the cerebral hemispheres proper would be absent, right? You also find failure of closure of the, um, uh, neural tube, uh, the, the new epithelium, right? Due to toxins, the new epithelium may, may still be there or may be absent, all right? So that's what's now. This is an example of the anencephaly. You see, that's the brain. That's you see, you see that we the brain, the cerebral hemispheres are failed to develop. But we can still find the eyes, okay? All right, we can still find the eyes, and you may find the brain stem. But the, and you may also find the anterior pituitary gland and all that, but you can't find the cerebral hemispheres. This is a typical example of an encephaly. It looks uh, gory, right? But that it is what it is. So now this is um, for that, um, furthermore, we have the cranial rachiskisis, all right? Uh, so cranial rachiskisis is also another uh, defect, which would extend down into the cervical spine. Looks like it's still an encephaly. But this one now, the, the failure of closure extends down even into the cervical spine around the neck. Okay, and I'll show you a picture quickly on what that is like. Okay, so this is it. It looks even more gory. All right, but uh, it is what it is too. So now this is another form of neural tube defects called encephalocils. Encephalocils, or what they call the cranial meningocils. Okay, in this situation, we do not have an exposure of the cerebral hemispheres. We do not have an exposure of the cerebral hemisphere. Rather, what we have is that it has a covering. The epidem epidermal layer is still covering it. Okay, and um, with that, you can it's safe, it's protected. Just that you have a cyst behind. Now let's look at this. So this is a picture showing you that. So you can see that the the um, the brain, the epidermal layer covers the the skull, all right, and it also covers the cyst. So it's not exposed, but there's a cyst, a big cyst that has deformed this skull. Now, with plastic surgery, uh, the pediatrician could actually correct this. Okay, so that's um, this is what they call the cranial meningocele or encephalocele. Okay, now this is another situation called the hydrocephalus, where we have the big head baby, right? The baby with the big head. This baby's head is not just big because it wants to be big. But there is an increased accumulation, which is abnormal, uh, um, increased accumulation of the cerebrospinal fluid. And this is abnormal. Uh, uh, this could occur because of maybe due to toxins or because um, the cerebrospinal fluid has been blocked somewhere such that it cannot um, escape all right, through the um, arachnoid villi into the, into the um, 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 vasculature, all right? So, because it should drain, uh, there is this there is this communication between the arachnoid villa and the and the um, uh, sinus venosus. All right, so such so, such so that it can drain into the uh, veins. All right, and then continue circulation. This keeps it balanced. All right, and it's uh, you know actually the cerebrospinal fluid should serve as shock absorber for the brain and, and this and central nervous system. So, oh, as it were, but now there is a blockage or there is an infection that is causing an increased secretion. All right more than absorption. So now this abnormality or this imbalance will lead to this. And why do we have it so prominent in the brain or in the um, skull? Because at this stage of development, the skull, the sutures, you remember the sutures, the skull bones have not ossified yet. And so the tendency of it expanding it so much, it's also important to note that this situation could occur in babies before birth and maybe after birth. Right, it depends on when, but um, uh, immediately after it could still occur, and that's why you see this. The babies have um, jungle, so I'll just take care of whatever is causing this um, uh, increased accumulation of cerebral spinal fluid. If it is blockage, remove the blockage. If it is uh, an infection, treat the infection, and the baby will get back fine. All right, there's another situation called microcephaly. In microcephaly, the baby here uh, has a small brain or small head. All right. And this is because of um, poor development or underdevelopment of the of the um, um, brain vesicles during um, development. So, so it's 
fail to develop. I'm going to go quickly into the brain vesicles to see how this occurs, where you have the three brain vesicles and the five brain vesicles. Because of this lecture, you're going to get to know about that. And uh, it's also important to see that this, has, this could also be caused by infections, all right? And it has been found in um, mothers infected with Zika, Zika virus, all right? Their babies have come down with this microcephaly. Very quickly, let's just look at the neural crest cells and what are they? These are cells that are found around the uh, lateral to the, the um, ectodermal plates, all right? And lateral aspect of the ectodermal plate as it thickens and forms a fold. So this is neural crest cells. And these cells are important. They will finally delaminate after the formation of the neural tube and lie lateral to the neural tube. They help to form several structures in the body, all right? In the mesen time, they will form the uh, chondroblast cells, all right, the osteoblasts that will help to form bone cells, okay? Then they also help to form fibroblasts, odontoblasts, myoblasts, um, and uh, adipocytes, all right? So you, in the new, in neurons, they form sensory neurons. They help to form cholinergic neurons, andrenergic neurons, the satellite neurons, Schwann cells, which help to myelinate the, um, um, the, the, the the neuroglia in the central, in the brain, all right, in the brain, in the central nervous system. While that of the, uh, we also have glial cells, all right, glial cells, including um, the astrocytes and all that, okay, within the, the, um, the central nervous system. And also some secretory cells, chromaffine cells, parafollicular cells, calcitonin producing cells, and also, pigmented cells known as the melanocytes, which helps to form thick, the black um, man's skin or the black, the black colorification of the skin. Okay, so uh, that's, that's cells from neural press cells, all right? So, all right, so again, they also help to form sensory ganglions of the feet, seven, eight, nine, and 10th cranial nerve. When I'm talking about the cranial nerves, I'll talk about the sensory ganglions. You just remember that they came from the neural crest cell. The feet is trigeminal, the seventh is the facial, the eighth is the, um, the, eighth is the uh, vestibulocochlear, and the ninth is the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve, and also the tenth, the vagus nerve. Okay, so they also form the sympathetic ganglion, and uh, I've talked about the swan cells before now. All right, so. Uh, just a minute. Uh, I'm, I think I made a mistake. The Schwann cells are actually for the peripheral nerves. Peripheral nerves. Uh, then, uh, yes, they're actually for the peripheral nerves. The oligodendro um, sites are for the, um, the central nervous system. Now, the development of the brain vesicles. Now, here we will look at the formation of three brain vesicles. And then afterwards, we look at formation five. So there are three brain vesicles at the fourth week of intrauterine life. We have the four brain vesicle, which is also known as the prosencephalon. Then we have the mid brain vesicle, also known as the mesencephalon. And we have the hind brain vesicle, which is also known as the rumbencephalon. So at the fifth week of intrauterine life, we have secondary brain vesicles formed. And this occurs due to division of these um, three brain vesicles. Not all three um, divide, just the first and the last one divide. The middle one, which is the mesencephalon, does not divide. So let's look at the divisions or the products of the prosencephalon. The prosencephalon divide into telencephalon and the diencephalon. Telencephalon and the diencephalon. Uh, whereas the rumbencephalon would divide into the metencephalon and the me myelencephalon. So um, how you're going to remember these divisions of the rumbencephalon, always remember that met before myelin. So me, M me then my, M-E for M-Y. So it will help you give you the arrangements of this thing. Because later on, we're going to look at the organs or the structures that, that develop from these different um, brain vesicles. So, Let's take that again. Let's just take that again. So tell uh, you 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 talk about, if you look at the phone number. You tell you 
talk about the phone number, you tell the phone number first before the person dials it, right? So tell, dial, then you have the mess, then you have met, and you have my. Never forget that arrangement. Tell, dial, mess, met, and dial. Sorry, met and mile. All right. So that's that's the correct arrangement. It gives you, it can stay now in your brain for a very long time. Okay. So now, so this is from the Roman uh, prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and Roman cephalon. Prosencephalon, mesencephalon, rumbencephalon, and this is spinal cord. So prosencephalon dividing into two. Let's look at the divisions: telencephalon, diencephalon. All right, mesencephalon does not divide at all. Mesencephalon is equivalent to the midbrain. All right, it doesn't divide at all. Then we also have the rumbencephalon, which divides into two: metencephalon and myelencephalon. So that that metencephalon will eventually give you pons and cerebellum while the myelencephalon will give you the medulla oblongata. And afterwards, we have a continuation of a spinal cord. Okay, so let's make progress. All right, so having said that about the brain ventricles, let's look at the brain ventricles and what are they? Um, we have cavities within these within this, um, brain vesicles, okay? We have cavities and these cavities are known as ventricles. Why are they called ventricles? Why not cavities? Because within them, are, um, we have the cerebrospinal flu um, fluid, and we also have the uh, choroid plexus, which secretes this uh, cerebrospinal fluid. So let's quickly look at these vesicles, these uh, ventricles. So in the telencephalon, we'll have two paired ventricles called the paired lateral ventricles. They'll drain through the foramen of uh, Munro into the dying cephalon, dying cephalon. The dying cephalon ventricle is known as the third ventricle. And the third ventricle will drain from there into the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct of Silvius. Cerebral aqueduct is the ventricle that represents the mesencephalon. So it's the ventricle in the mesencephalon, all right? And the fourth ventricle is the ventricle in the rumbent cephalon. And that's how we have this. Um, these are the ventricles represented in this vesicle, five brain vesicles. Okay, so having said that, we also have the plexures, the brain plexures. So we have three brain plexures. We have the cephalic plexure, which is um, uh, separates the forebrain from the midbrain. So it's also known as the mesencephalic plexure uh, because it is it directly demarcates the mesencephalus from the prosencephalus. Okay, then we also have the pontine plexure which divides the metencephalon from the myelencephalon. Remember that the metencephalon is what forms the pons and the cerebellum, while the myelencephalon will form the medulla oblongata. So it divides the metencephalon from the myelencephalon. All right. Then we have the cervical pleasure. This cervical pleasure is the last pleasure which divides the, um, the brain from the spinal cord. So it divides the medulla oblongata and separates it from the spinal cord. All right. Having said that, Let's take a look at the picture. And that, so that's the picture. And I'll show you the, um, the pontine flexure, the cervical flexure. And where do you think the, the um, cephalic flexure is going to be? Between the midbrain and the forebrain. OK. So uh, yeah, so this is the brainstem. Brainstem comprises the middle of longata, the pons, and the midbrain. Middle of longata, the pons, and the midbrain. The Careful not to include the cerebellum in there. Pons, midbrain, medulla, let's arrange it properly. Midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. All right, so now let's take a look at the spinal cord. What the spinal cord, how the spinal cord develops. So now below or caudal to the fourth pair of somites. All right you have the spinal cord developing. And as it begins to develop, we have the uh, pseudo stratified columnar epithelium in the walls of the ventricular zone of the ependymal layer. Ventricular zone, which is also known as the ependymal layer of the spinal cord. This is the innermost layer of the uh, spinal cord. And I'm gonna show you that 
in a GB on, um, uh, so that you can see the inner layers of what happens there. The cells within this layer, this ventricular zone, would, would proliferate and go outwards, all right? Outwards, and as they proliferate, they form different layers. So it gives, also gives rise, this layer, these cells will give rise to neurons and microglial cells, all right? And, and, and an example of these microglial cells are the oligodendrocytes and the astrocytes. So now, the, these cells, as they proliferate, like I said earlier, they proliferate and form outer parts, which are called the marginal zone, cells on the marginal zone, right? And they migrate into the um, outer layer, so the marginal zone. And um, this will eventually give rise to what they call the white matter, okay? So you will see that in the spinal cord, we have the gray matter and we have the white matter. Uh, so now the spinal cord, or the white, well, this white matter is made up of axons, axons that move all right from the uh, from the um, um, soma body, which is within the gray matter, all right, outwards, outwards, down into the peripheral nervous system, and um, um, and the supply or the innervates the um, body, all right. So. We have some of these um, new epithelial cells differentiating to neuroblast cells, which are primordial neurons. Okay, and um, so the, these embryonic cells from the intermediate form the intermediate zone. So now that you have an outward layer, you have an inward layer, which an outward layer called the marginal zone, an inner layer called the ventricular zone. So as this um, cells proliferate for that there is a clear distinction that there's a middle layer all right and this middle layer is what they call the mantle layer or the intermediate zone the intermediate zone so let's take a look at um, some of the structures that would also be formed in the course of all this development we have the glioblast cells uh these are supporting cells all right supporting cells and um uh, they differentiate from the new epithelial cells uh, and uh, once this differentiation has stopped, you have that these uh, these cells, these supporting cells that have been formed, will migrate into the intermediate and marginal zones. So now these glioblast cells would form astroblasts, which would eventually form astrocytes, and oligodendroblasts, which will eventually form oligodendrocytes. They are supporting cells. They support the neurons and they support the central nervous system as, as a whole. All right. When the um, new epithelial cells, I said that when they stop um, producing neuroblast and glioblast cells, the, the differentiates, all right? These, these new epithelial cells will differentiate into what they call epidermal cells, which will help to form the epidermal, all right? The epidermal cells will line the central canal of the spinal cord. And uh, via the sonic hedgehog signaling controls, um, they would help to uh, regulate regulate um, uh, um, formation of these epidermal cells, all right, and the flow of cerebrospinal fluid within. So let's um, look at other cells like the microglia cells. It's another supporting cell that is found very tiny, tiny cells scattered, um, um, scattered all over the central nervous system, all right. The actually start up late in the fetal, uh, period, fetal, fetal development, all right, so the late period of fetal development after the blood vessels have penetrated the central nervous system, all right? So they originate from the bone marrow and they are specialists in phagocytosis, all right, phagocytosis. So they envelope, cell, envelope um, toxins and send them out of the, of the central nervous system via the cerebrospinal fluid too. Okay, so uh, now in all this, I'm gonna take the picture soon, so just bear with me. Now in all this, the spinal cord, as this is happening, as this differentiation is going on, the spinal cord is eventually divided into two by what they call the sulcus limitans. Sulcus limitans. So it's divided into the dosal region, also known as the ala plate, and the, and the um, ventral region, also known as the basal plate. Eventually, this ala plate will form the um, will form neurons that are afferent, so sensory neurons, while the 
ventral plates would form neurons that are efferents. So they are motor neurons. Okay. So the enlargement of the ala and basal plates produce fissures called the um, the ala plates will produce a fissure called the posterior median septum, and the basal plates will produce a fissure called the anterior median fissure. So let's take a look at them now. So this is a diagram. And this is the sulcus limitant. Sulcus limitant divides it into two. All right. So this is the ala and this is the uh, basal. Okay. So let's look at them properly. Okay. So we find that the basal will form motor neurons, motor neurons, which are efferent neurons, while the ala plates form sensory neurons that are afferents. Okay. Afferents. Okay. So this is a trunk of spinal nerve that has both efferents and afferents. Okay. Now, as this continues developing, remember I said that we have inner gray matter and outer white matter. So you see that the outer white matter has been formed, and this is the inner gray matter that has the soma bodies and also the nuclei with deep within here. While this is the outer matter that has the axons, a lot of axons here, all right, outer white matter, okay? So, and that's that. Now, the Basal plates would also have the ventral median fissure form, and while we have the dosal plate, the ala plate for having the um, dosal septum, or what they call the posterior median septum. Okay, so this is neuroepithelial cells and how they divide. This is found within the um, the um, the uh, plates, the neural plates. Okay, all right, and uh, it forms. So that's the so that's the neural tube. But this is around the spinal cord area right now. And um, that's the new epithelial cells forming. And these new epithelial cells will form this is the ventricular zone, which I said is the inner part, this is the marginal zone, which I said is the outer part. Now imagine this is the intermediate zone. Okay. So that's how they, they move, they proliferate that way. You see a dividing cell within the ventricular zone. So the ventricular zone is the is the um the factory or the engine room where these things are divided. Okay, so now let's look at meninges. Meninges. So we have the mesenchyme around the neural tube condenses. So around the neural tube, the mesenchyme there will condense and form what they call the primordial meninges, or also the primordial meninges. So um, now this, it will, this meninges will divide into two. Right? We have the external layer, which is called the dura mater, and it's from the parchy meninges. And we also have the internal layer, which is called the lepto meninges. Uh, okay, the inner layer, lepto meninges, the outer layer, parchy meninges, right? Or parchy meninges, right? So the outer layer, dura matter, while the inner layer has two matters, as it were, the pi matter and the arachnoid matter. The pi matter being the innermost layer, while the arachnoid matter is um, the, the um, middle layer, okay? Right now, middle layer, because they are now, they are, to clear, there are three different layers now. There's the dura matter layer, there's the arachnoid matter layer and there is the pi matter layer, okay? So the pi and the arachnoid are from the lepto meninges. So fluid field spaces will form within these lepto meninges. And sooner, sooner and later, they will coalesce and form what they call subarachnoid space. Subarachnoid space that's below the arachnoid, all right? Now, so that space is where the cerebral spinal fluid will begin to form and uh, move around within that space. And this happens around the fifth week of development. So let's look at positional changes in the spinal cord. As the baby develops, the spinal cord also um, changes in position. So quickly, it's important to note that from the very beginning, spinal cord had extended the entire length of the vertebral, um, uh, intervertebral foramen that extended the entire length, right? And you have spinal nerves leaving the intervertebral foramina at their equivalent levels, okay? So at S1, you have spinal nerve S1 leaving there freely, all right, horizontal to it and all that. At the S5, spinal nerve S5 will be going out horizontal to it. But see what happens as the baby grows within the womb, okay? So the spinal, the vertebral column becomes larger, all right? But the spinal, nerve, spinal cord is not growing anymore. It has completed its growth. So the, the vertebral column is getting larger. And so what happens? The spinal cord begins to move upwards, begins to move upwards. Uh, so to say, because it's vertebral columns are getting larger, vertebral um, vertebrae, vertebrae getting larger. 
So at six months, you have the um, spinal cord at level of S1. And at birth, you have the spinal cord at the level of L3. And in adults, because it's still developing, in adults, you have the spinal cord at the level of L1. Okay. Having said that, this is the picture showing you the spinal cord. All right. This is the spinal cord at um, S1. That is um, at um, uh, six months. All right. S1. Now you see there at L3 at birth. Okay. And in adults, you find it here at um, L1. So in between L1 and L2, you find the spinal cord there. Okay. Now you notice that we have some other things like the conus medullaris, the phylum terminally. Okay. Uh, okay. And the co let's go, let's go into that. This is the uh, meninges now of the spinal cord and how they uh, follow suit in this uh, growth of the baby. So the conus medullaris simply means the um, spinal cord tapers towards the lower end and expands a bit. That end is called the conus. Um, um, medullaris, and that's it. Oh, sorry, this is a wrong picture. Let's look at the next picture. I think I, I mixed it up. Okay, so that's the conus medullaris here, conus medullaris, and um, the corda equina is this is the corda equina. It's actually a horse, looks horse shaped like, it's like a horse tail, horse tail, all right, the tail of a horse. Now, this occurs because the you see the nerves, spinal nerves that were originally at the same level. At the same intervertebral level, intervertebral foramina level. Now the spinal cord has moved upwards, and they now they looking like as if they are descending from there into their respective intervertebral foramina. Okay, so that forms a horse-like tail. Okay, a horse tail-like um, uh, structure, which is known as the corda equina. Okay, so. Having said that, uh, it's also important to note that the dura matter and arachnoid matter end at S2 in adults, while the pi matter would extend to the coccyx and form what they call the phylum terminale. So, abnormalities in the spinal cord, failure to close, close what would happen? Would form what they call spina bifida. Spina bifida. So either it's a spina bifida falter or a spina bifida cystica. And this occurs around the L, um, L5 S1, so lumbosacral region. Okay, now there are different types of spinal bifida cystica. We have the spinal bifida meningocele, spinal bifida meningomyocele. Uh, we have spinal bifida um, melostesis. We have spinal bifida seringomyelocele. Right, these are different types of uh, spinal bifida cystica that occurs. All right, and um, again, this could be. This could be observed using ultrasonography and amniotic fluid testing. There's a picture showing you kind of spinal bifida, all right? So that's um, spinal bifida cystica, you can see the cyst, okay? And um, this is another kind of spinal bifida uh, myelogesis. Myelogesis, okay? So let's look at um, the pictures, how they appear in ultrasound, all right? After an ultrasound has been done or an MRI has been done, this is what you find. So you find that um, this is occult, uh, you find hair patch around the lumbosacral region. Okay, it's actually a lot, of, a lot of times it's asymptomatic. It doesn't cause any troubles because the spinal cord is still working, it's not compressed and all that. So it can still work fine. Now, this is a, cyst, a cystica. And you can see that the uh, dura mater comes outwards. Dura mater is out. All right, and the, but the spinal cord is still within that. There's a big cyst out here. So that's a cystica. Oh, okay, so now we also have now here, there could be issues because this is what they call the meningomyosis. Meningomyosis, you see that the spinal bifid, the dura mater is out, also the subarachnoid and all that are, so, um, the subarachnoid space, the arachnoid matter and the fire matter has been taken outwards too. And here, there could be issues, a lot of challenges here. Um, uh, the, the surgeon will just have to correct this by taking these things downwards and depends on the extent of damage uh, the child may still have a normal life. So this is myelogesis, myelogesis. Okay, so, and this is, um, um, it doesn't have a cyst. That's different, it doesn't have a cyst. Okay, uh, but the spinal cord has been shifted from its normal position, but there is no cyst. So that's myelogesis. Good, important for you to note the differences in all this. Okay, so this is a baby having the cystica. Okay, and this is also a picture showing you different types of spinal bifida. 
So I want to say thank you so much for listening. You can um, check the masteranatomy.info for several other lectures on this on this um, 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 study, on this new anatomy or it, a head and neck or on any other aspect of anatomy. Also, check the quizzes. We have sample quizzes, but if you subscribe, you could have access to several other quizzes. Several other quizzes. If you subscribe, um, you, you would have this good access so that you can rehearse and practice to get to know whether, how good are you in your anatomy. Thank you so much for uh, listening to us, uh, the Master Anatomy Info. Do have a nice time. We'll see you again, same time. Cheers.